Okay, so now it's actually working. Good. Um, we are back with the continuation of the 77th episode of this podcast. Um, now that you guys can actually hear me, let me know if I'm coming in too loud or just right, because this is a brand new headset. See what happens when you change out new equipment? <laughs> well, these were a Christmas gift. I had to use them. Oh, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're like watching the stream right now. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure they're like... If you, Mikey, better be using his new headset... Or I'm gonna <laughs> yell at him right now. <laughs> I'll, I'll get a phone call. You'll you'll hear uh, my mom screeching at me. You didn't put my quilts on your bed, and you didn't wear my headset that I sent you for Christmas. <laughs> so what, well, what I'm playing with my new gift. What's that? I'm 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 uh, playing this on my uh, new Surface Pro. Oh, oh nice. Yeah, right. You your didn't get Surface that for Pro four. You can get that for free from Microsoft when you were working there? You didn't just yep. like, five-finger discount it? <laughs> no. So um, with with uh, big tech, uh, we don't get – you don't uh, get too too good, big of a discount um, at Microsoft. It's more with, like software, things like that. So I actually found that um, my uh, – I got a actually even better discount through my sister who is still in school. I got it through her. So what you're saying is you – pirated the soft the the, the um the discount from her <laughs> yeah. you went through Maybe it partly. To the means to acquire a discounted surface i'm writing this all down right now i'm gonna turn it into the folks the microsoft that, police know. oh no <laughs> yeah <laughs> not the microsoft, no, microsoft ninjas no. they're uh it's we're gonna escalate this to the ninja the ninja group <laughs> no so, but i yeah i i i like the the stuff I've gotten at Wizards of the Coast has already been pretty crazy. Like uh, I had enough. Basically, I was able to give my family. They didn't want it, but they got. They all got like a hundred Magic the Gathering cards <laughs> for Christmas. They're like, oh, they even oh, you're Magic. so thoughtful. Thank you. <laughs> were um, they, them the, the like the Uber rare ones where I saw people like ra- unwrapping uh, the the cards and going through them and finding like this one this card is worth thirteen thousand dollars stuff like that. Uh, no, actually, one of them did get a one of them got a pretty rare card. One of them got a card that's like worth a hundred bucks. That's not right. too bad. Yeah, yeah. Well. I don't think the thirteen thousand ones are in print anymore. I think they stopped printing those probably like two, in like ninety four. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, he said he spent for like uh, thirty bucks on the pack. It was still uh, un- unwrapped, or it was still uh, uh, oh. wrapped up and un- never opened. So interesting. So it was one of those older packs. He's like, wow, I really appreciate this older art. And then he's like, well, this is all junk, all junk. And then it was the last card in the deck that was some kind of uh, rare ruby. Hmm. Something about nine power? I don't know. Probably Charizard. <laughs> Quite possibly. All right, so we're back to Project Spark now. No. Uh, Brian, are you aware of the changing format of the Thursday streams coming up? Um... Uh, there were, yes, I but I forget. All right, so <laughs> I I read that Sparkcast, but I also haven't gotten sleep for two for three days. Well, Thomas <laughs> is going to be uh, like, Thomas yeah. is going to be showing off a line of new clothing on Thursday streams. He is doubling as a model for the Microsoft Corporation. Oh right, that's right. He's wearing uh, the new Melvin garb. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Here's like Melvin yeah. garb. <laughs> yeah, this is what Melvin made. Am I no, okay? No. The Spark Melvin. Oh, you want to see my runway? So that doesn't look that doesn't look too Spark themed. You should tell Melvin to make some more Spark themed clothes. Okay. Yeah. Got it. More, more owl bear and less plaid. <laughs> yeah, that's still very Seattle. Yep. <laughs> nice. No, actually, it's funny because I am. So you guys are all talking about your gifts or whatever, and I'm wearing my my Christmas gift, which was a Microsoft band. Oh, so, nice. Yeah. So. I'm actually really enjoying it so far. Like, so far I've walked 2,700 uh, steps today. So I like the, I like, kind of tracking my, like, fitness and, you know, my heart rate and, like, how good my sleep was and stuff like that. So, you know, I've used it for, like, I don't know, close to a week now, I guess. And it's been really, it's been really fun to have. It's, like, different. Like, it's not really a, you know, watch replacement, um, which I kind of, or, you know, phone replacement, which, well, I, which I like that it's not. It's more of, like, kind of augments and it, like, kind of brings notifications to you so you don't have to, like, dig out your phone. Um, but, yeah, it's been pretty enjoyable so far. But that, that's what I got, my major gift for Christmas. So someone in the audience was uh, a bit concerned with the specifications required for using Project Spark. Uh, oh, yeah. mm-hmm. 
I remember a long time ago there was thoughts of having a uh, what was it called a 2D overlay layer that would be able to function on many other things. I know that this is unlikely to ever happen because of the reduced uh, development cycle. But how far did that ever get? Do you guys know? Um, it was definitely investigated. Uh, I would you know it was never close to I'd say like something that would go out you know to production. Um, you know, there was basically prototyping stages that were going on where everything is really rough around the edges, but, um, but yeah, exactly. We wouldn't be, you know, going that route now, especially with kind of lower, um, you know, development resources and, you know, less, you know, moving out of active development where we wouldn't be building kind of a, a lower tier, you know, version of Spark. Um, but, you know, like, I think one thing that's really cool about, you know, technology, right, is, you know, basically the baseline gets you know, it's cheaper and cheaper to buy into stuff like, right, you're, you know, you can go buy a smartphone now for, you know, a really good smartphone for like 50 bucks sometimes, right? And that would have, you know, and it's better than what you could have spent, you know, $800 for, you know, a smartphone, you know, four years ago. So I think that kind of, you know, that happens with computers too. So, you know, if you're not able, you know, to buy in and get something that's, you know, so in your words in chat, like a potato, right? <laughs> um, a potato PC, um, you know, I think you can, you know, price does come down over time, at least from what I, you know, pretty quickly, you know, like I would say like probably within a year, you know, I think a baseline computer would probably be able to run Spark. Because the original Surface yeah. Pro was able to run one, right? Uh, mm. The Surface, the original Surface Pro could not, I think it started with Surface Pro 2 was able to do yeah. Spark. I mean, you can now get a P, you can now get a laptop for 300 bucks that uh, can run Spark. It's so, and it'll, it'll get better and better over time. Yeah, and yeah, next time we talk next year, you know, that $300 PC will be like $100. So, <laughs> yeah, like, at the end of the day is it's, Project Spark is really, it is a really graphic intensive product because it you like not only do you have um, a lush three environment which is highly pixelated or highly uh, detailed polygonal also yeah detailed uh, pixelated and textured um, but you can change them all in any anyway so you need a lot of graphical power in order to do that so that's it's not quite the same as say something like RPG maker where it's just 2d sprites walking around on a screen which you could run on like your TI-83 calculator. <laughs> You're right. Very yeah. close, yes. Um, <laughs> so would the uh, standalone version have any impact on what specifications are required? Because I know it does hypothetically run on Windows 7, but what about the system, speci uh, system specifications? I, I don't, I, you know, as far as, like, the specifications for that model, I don't think it'll be any different because um, it's still be, you know, it'll still be doing the exact same, you know, creation engine that we already have and implement with all the assets. Um you know, so as far as what, you know, that's that's the intense part. The things that do get changed in the standalone is, um, you know, like the way it connects to services and talks to the operating software. But I don't think we'll see any benefits um, with that, you know, with the standalone version, um, you know, as far as, you know, lowering specs and making it more accessible. All right. So there is one thing I want to get off my chest before I forget. Um, Brian and Thomas, there were a lot of people who started their game jam entries but didn't finish them were you oh, two among mm -hmm. them <laughs> hey all right no, I, 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 I knew this was coming as soon as you said you were gonna be smart guest. <laughs> I, I actually i finished actually uh everything except for there was some dungeon level that for some reason <laughs> uh i don't think i ever got <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thomas is crying now. <laughs> yeah, no, I uh, that was my my own that was my fault um, for sure. So I guess yeah, you could say we were in that category. Um, yeah, I need to do that dungeon. Um, <laughs> well, that's the thing. I, like, you have, if you're in a collaboration, you have to be able to depend on people. And yeah, I'm obviously not very dependable. <laughs> you want to make yeah, sure this Thomas team. guy, he should have been cut out from the beginning. <laughs> you have to pick your team wisely, because if you uh, get a bunch of flakes, you're not going to have a product. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, I, I was looking at, like, uh, for... I So I actually, I finished the whole thing except for the dungeon, and I was looking at, all right, what if I just cut out the dungeon and go right to the factory level? <laughs> and then it gets... I don't, know, I don't know, it just, it really, it feels really short, and, like, you, you, you play through, and you're like, this feels like something that's really cut out of it because, like, see this huge dungeon right there that like has this big gate, and you're like, 
What was it? What's that big dungeon for? Well, well, that's when you have the little cutscene and say, "Man, that was a fantastic adventure we had just had in the dungeon. That took like six months." <laughs> it shows them like walk yeah. in and then like black screen and just fades back and they walk out and they're like have a beard now. <laughs> yeah, or like go go the South Park route of you're just like looking at the character like, "Oh my God, that's the most epic battle ever!" And it's just like looking at the people watching the battle. You just go look at the guy, like, watching the dungeon, like, oh, wow, such adventure. Jab, then, jab. Like, because you're right to go through the dungeon to, to, to get a key. Um, and also, <laughs> I was like, well, I could just I just put put it out unfinished. And then I played through everyone else's game jam entry. And was like, oh, man, their, even our finish thing isn't anywhere near as good as everyone's finished stuff. So I guess I'll just wait until um, Thomas gets a chance to finish up the dungeon level and then maybe I can add some things on top of it because this is only the, it's only like the first 45 minutes to an hour of the gameplay. So maybe I can add on a few more things into it. Yeah. I'll, I'll work on your dungeon on new year's when I have the day off. <laughs> so there's, you, a few, go ahead. I was going to say, um, good luck with that. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> yeah, you know me. You're gonna like. You're gonna be like. I'm gonna be like in the middle of Fallout Four or whatever. <laughs> you're like. What's yeah, and then we're, we're, we'll, we'll be like, want to play Halo? And then I invite <laughs> you to a party, and it's really Project Spark. You're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Fallout was actually one of the other presents I got this year. My brother gave it to me, hmm. so he never wants to see oh, me nice. again. Is what that's about. Like the game or an actual Fallout of the world? Well, I think the latter hasn't happened yet, so. <laughs> Though knowing him, I wasn't sure if there was something like one-time redeemable fallout of the world. <laughs> Quite possibly, he works with the uh, United States Mil United States military, so and their applied physics department. So, yeah, it's possible. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a couple good questions in chat. Uh, one of which is related to the props that are upcoming, and I know that we have a couple experts on that field here. Um, are any of them uh, leaf-like props? Uh, from the top of my head, no. I don't believe any are more, like, vegetative. No. Well, there is, no. Yeah, there's no leaves, but there's the, there's the, um, the pomegranate. Oh, yeah, the pomegranate. That's, that's, that's vegetation fruit. Like, yeah, there is one new fruit. <laughs> so is it cut open pomegranate, or does it just look like a sphere? It's like a solid it's, pomegranate, like picked off. But it's off a of highly it. reflective one too. That's the interesting <laughs> thing. It's like very different than another fruit, so which is like which is what caused Thomas and I to be like, yeah, we should probably add this. This is pretty cool. Even though it's just a pomegranate. <laughs> you like saw it, and you're like, why is it? Li why is it like that? And you're like looking around it. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> then there's a pomegranate seed, which actually looks like a gem, which is nice because more gems is better. Yep. More little collectibles. Mm -hmm. And uh, but no, I don't think the, there's the wooden coin. That, right. that one, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to because I feel, I always felt like we needed more like more currency. Um, so it's nice that we're gonna have a second tier of currency of, of kind of wooden coins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll be nice. And then as far as your gold coin, you can like make it bronze, silver, mm -hmm. gold if you want to. So, yep. Another question from chat is. Uh, what was your first contact with the game industry, and how does being in the game industry feel now? I guess this goes to both of you, actually. And um, you, too, because you have yeah. contacts in the game industry. I guess, just they don't talk to me anymore, except for you two, but you don't talk to me too <laughs> much anymore. anymore. Um, you can go first, Brian, since yours um, chronologically is before mine. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't until Project Spark, so I think oh, oh. it might be the same. Oh, they said uh, contact with game making. Sorry. So I guess. Oh, game making, not game makers. Okay, sorry. Uh, my first contact with game making was. Um, was it RPG Maker or before? No, it was before RPG Maker. Um, this was like ninety nine or two thousand. There is this uh, little program that um, I used to play the heck out of called it was just literally called 3D Game Maker um, and it was so terrible the, <laughs> the amount of stuff you could customize was like basically it made a level for you and it's like you can customize four things it's your own game <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so I, but I, I still played around with that, and I figured out ways to mod it and uh, get deeper and deeper. But yeah, that was my that was my first way into it, and I always I always loved just creating stuff. And it wasn't until later on that I loved um, like when I was growing up, I loved making movies, I loved writing stories, I loved making music, um, and I loved programming. And it wasn't until um, later on, like after after graduating college, where I realized, wait a minute. If I love all those things, there's just one thing that uses all those things, and that's video game making. So I, I didn't get big into it until then, but that was way before I got big into it. It was just me messing around, pussing around with this 3D game maker thing. I think the best thing I made was like basically a Turok-like game where you fight against T-Rexes with a shotgun. Nothing wrong with that? I can go with yeah, yep. I, for that. <laughs> I could use a good Turok game. I think I, I like the one that was on... I think it was on 360. It was pretty decent. I only played the original uh, uh, N64 N64, one. N64, yeah. I played that one, but I never could get very far because it was yeah. really hard. <laughs> Same. I just like going in there shooting dinosaurs in the face until they killed me and then, you know, do it again. Yeah, you just like get yeah. mauled all the time. I think the, the problem with the most recent one was like you, you they like combine like human and like dino enemies, but like it... The main threat is the humans, and that kind of takes away. Like, you never felt like super terrified of the dinos because they were more like scripted events when you would encounter them. It wasn't like, I think I remember from old Turok, it was just like you just all of a sudden get mauled by a, a dino, <laughs> and that was like any time, any place. It's just, bro, <laughs> and you're done. <laughs> Pretty much. Wait, were they like human dino hybrids? No. Like, humosaurs? The no, there was like these. I don't know, it was like planet, because it's kind of like a sci-fi-ish, if I remember correctly, too, like on a different planet. Um, so they had cyborg dinosaurs, basically. There's no cyborg, no, there's, there's like normal dinosaurs, but it's like a sci-fi universe where you like crash, I think, on a dino planet. Oh, you're talking so about, like, so that's, that's the, oh, the new Torok, not the old one. Yeah. Because the old one definitely did have cybernetic dinosaur hybrids. Okay. I remember yeah. that, I do remember that, yeah. It had, it had awesome cheat codes, too. I can't remember that far back as far as cheat codes go. Yeah, you could actually input cheat codes and do like DK size heads. You could. Oh There's right. all these crazy unlockables. I remember that stuff now. It's just coming like, back. Yeah, now. just just like with um, just like Goldeneye. It was kind of that same kind of thing. Mm. Yep. I have so all right, <laughs> but didn't I don't think either one of you answered the question yet, right? Yeah, Thomas. That was just that was uh, just um, rant. <laughs> So my, uh, I started uh, probably, I think my first experience with like making a game per se was, um, I was really big into uh, Age of Empires 2 and like RTS, I just loved that game. Um, oh, that's so I funny, remember... I just reinstalled that like a few days ago and started playing around with it again. Oh, it's it's so great. Um, actually, but yeah, my so dad, friend's dad like... actually created, a, helped create Age of, Age of Empires 2, so. Nice. Ooh, awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Um, but yeah, so that was like my very first and like, I, I think I, you know, I, I love like playing it, but I, you know, found like a passion in the whole map make, making editor section and where you can kind of do the triggers and set up like different events and kind of do your own storytelling with like troops. And I don't know, I just, you know, like building out those campaigns, you know, and there was like my first experience and I, and I kind of found a passion for it and like the design of like the maps and like you know I was you know at the time like Lord of the Rings was starting to get like really really popular and I think the first movie had come out by that point and I was like trying to recreate like Middle Earth in like the map and you know and like I had like the the book open to the map there and I'm like sitting there trying to like get the thing and it was poorly done that's for sure <laughs> like scale wise <laughs> I was like I want to get Brie on here, but Brie, like, takes up, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> make it like a town is, you know, is because it's like a little dot on the map. So it was kind of a challenge. It was, like, kind of a challenge, but it was, like, in a way, it was, like, balancing, like, how to make it a good game versus, like, historically accurate or, you know, to that universe or whatever. So it was, it was interesting. I really enjoyed that. And, you know, I did a lot of map editing, kind of building there, and I also did... Um, Age of Empires 2, there was, like, a, a counterpart, a Star Wars edition um, that, like, was, like, a, basically a reskin of Age of Empires 2. And that was, like, really, really fun, too. And I, like, was switched over and did a lot of, um, like, doing the exact same thing, map editing and stuff, but within the, like, Star Wars universe where you could do that. Um, then really after that, um, I kind of switched over to console gaming and didn't really do too much game making. I'm trying to think if there was anything on 360. So you hear that, kids? 
Using console games instead of PC games sucks the creativity out of you. <laughs> well, like I admit, I didn't, you know, I I didn't discover Kodu. Um, I know that was on 360, but I actually never discovered, you know, discovered that or played around with it on on there. I kind of got, I was more of the, I was like my, you know, teenager or whatever, and I was more into like my shooters and stuff by that point. <laughs> A lot of gears in Halo, I guess. Um, but uh, yeah, and then pretty much college and then you know and then I found out and saw Spark and that's like that's when I really dug deep and kind of that passion reignited back into me. So I guess my first creation experience was with uh, the map editors of like Warcraft 2, Starcraft, um, Heroes of Light and Magic. So that was those were things I would just go haywire on and just have fun with. With Starcraft the map editors I would Pretty much edit other people's maps and then like improve them slightly so if someone made an RPG in custom map settings uh, I would go in there and I would tinker with it I was one of those people and increment the version number by 0 0.01 and then just resubmit it and then have everybody really play it with it with, with me um, and then I guess with Spark I found out about that when I was looking into uh, Land EverQuest Landmark, which mm, uh, yeah mm -hmm. was another a product that was then by Sony Online Entertainment, now Daybreak Games, where it was sort of like a aged up uh, Minecraft of sorts, just not. Mm -hmm. That's pretty recent too. Yeah, um, can't remember when Landmark yeah. came out, but pretty much the same time as uh, Spark, though they're still in beta, I believe. So, gotcha. Yeah. Well, yeah. that makes sense because they had that. They know they've had that huge transition from Sony, you know, Entertainment Online now over to Daybreak, and I'm sure that's kind of changed their plans quite a bit. Oh, imagine. yeah. Their uh, personnel changed drastically, because I was, like, friends with a lot of them the way I was friends with, well, am friends with a lot of Team Dakota. Um, mm -hmm. So I got to see all of them, like, just flood out of the, into the, the ether, as it were, looking for jobs. Yeah. Anyway... <laughs> On a more positive notes, uh, one of the uh, questions that... Oh, let's go through the questions of uh, the community members for the uh, State of Sparks with Brian. Have him answer those. Because I was just thinking about, like, what, are your, what are your <laughs> intentions for, like, the... For, what are your hopes and aspirations for Project Spark and that sort of thing? Oh, yeah, you're talking about the creator spotlight. Yeah. Gotcha. I actually have it up, so let me. I can. I can do this. So, Brian, if I know you have, you were half. You know, probably three quarters asleep when you read the state of Spark that just went up. But we're doing a new uh, creator spotlight kind of situation, so we're like kind of doing a mm -hmm. Q and A with people. Um, and I don't know. I think people are hopefully enjoyed that we like the first time we did it was this one. Um, but we're asking um, some questions, you know, toward community members. So. Uh, I'm gonna. I'll just prompt you with these, and then you can answer them. <laughs> Maybe we'll eventually have to turn it into like an official one. What if I answer them wrong, though? If, uh, I, get, if I get the questions wrong, then what happens? Moose will end the stream, and you'll never be invited again. <laughs> no, actually, what's gonna happen is you're gonna be fired because we'll get the internet to go against him. When the internet's against you, you're not allowed to be employed ever again. <laughs> really, <laughs> the internet will blackball it's, you. <laughs> it's it's pretty. It is actually pretty scary for like for people who are like very publicly out there that like if the internet ever went against them that really would happen <laughs> yeah because i mean that's all that's all their topic of, of discussion so basically i that that comes down to the the will wheaton uh philosophy don't be a dick <laughs> this is a pg-13 stream brian you should know better that's pg-13 don't that's be definitely. like the gentleman whose name is dick oh okay. he's bad don't be like richard nixon basically <laughs> yep Cool. All right, let me uh, I'll let me read these questions off. Um, all right, so number one, Brian. What for, is your quest? For $100. <laughs> Describe your out. first experience hearing about Project Spark and your first time using it. I think I've said this quite a few times, but my first time ever was at E3 2013, where it was first revealed. Um, my, that was my first time hearing about it, and it was exactly what I was looking for in low barrier game design. 
So at that point, I'd mess around with uh, RPG Maker. I'd also done uh, some scripting on Python games. Um, I did no scripting, but I did not. I won. At one point, I opened up Unreal and then quickly closed it down. I was like, uh, no, 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 <laughs> too much, too much. Um, so for for me, it was like the, the perfect thing where RPG Maker was great, but you could only make 2D sprite games, and it was very limiting on the kind of types of, the types of games I wanted to make. So Project Spark seemed to scratch that itch, and I uh, like the day it was announced, I signed up for beta, and then I followed it from there on out. And I actually didn't join the community until I actually had it. I would passively watch the community um, while before I had it, Lurking. and was jealous about all of the people who the very very early the out early alpha people who were talking about, oh man, this is so cool. I got super jealous. But then January second was when I got my beta code and like immediately jumped in. All right, nice. so interject. Uh, there is a good question, chat. Why did you leave Team Dakota? It was your dream job, right? Yep, it was. So I guess like every there you could you could have more than one dream job, and so like I, there's a lot of jobs in the in the gaming industry which would be dream jobs to me, which would make me want to move on to that. And so one of them was um, working on uh, was working on you know I love Magic the Gathering, and one of them was was getting to work on that. But the thing that made me actually want to leave because uh, I was the I was interested in in like Magic the Gathering, but I was still like kind of set on Spark. Is actually basically the amount of responsibility that I was given in this new role. It's like it's a huge it's a huge jump up in me for responsibility. Uh, so that was really what cemented the deal at first. I, I think Thomas has, has said this also, but at first when I was offered the job, I was like, oh, it's cool, but no thanks. And then I was kind of re-offered with, uh, with more responsibility, and I kind of couldn't say no to it. So, it, But, it, you know, it happens. Um, typically in the gaming industry, uh, someone won't stay at a company for more than like a year, a year and a half. That's just sort of how the gaming industry goes, because you have games that are um, made quickly, and then once a the game's done, then typically someone moves on to the next project. So... Um, change happens often as people who have really been following the in the Project Spark community of the actual developers of Project Spark have noticed things have changed and that's uh, that's typical so one of those things that uh, was bound to happen is one of your faces leaving I guess I was the second of your faces because Mike Lesko also left off too I think he's in Montreal now on Ubisoft I forget that's the I, last I, I heard but I last I saw he was doing security again so I don't know that was according to his Twitter Oh really? Oh, I thought I thought he got like I thought he got something at Ubisoft. Um, so the, the other point I wanted to make was uh, how much of a factor was the fact that it was a uh, you were in a contractor position, with the stipulations of you know terms of service and how that all worked out. That was I mean that was part of it. So um, at Microsoft, uh, typically you're hired on in. Uh, not a what's called an FTE position, but a contractor position. So eventually, you can only work so much time until you basically your contract elapses and you have to take a six month break, which is at that point where most people kind of move on. So for me, um, I still had five months or so left before I would have had to think about that. So I still had plenty of time. So it was it was starting to definitely um, fit into um, my consideration, but I still had enough time to really. Like you know, spend time to, to look at opportunities um, to transfer on to full time at Microsoft or other opportunities. But this kind of yeah, I mean, it kind of came up and it was super fast. Once I said yes, I'm just like suddenly I was gone. <laughs> it's like when uh, college football ho coaches take uh, positions on other teams. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to stick around after you've made the decision to transfer. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Basically, what we we're saying is you are no longer good for Project Spark, Brian. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Mm. All right. Yeah. So we can go on with the uh, rest of the interview, I guess. Question oh, number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was gonna comment. I was just gonna say, like, you know, about your, you know, your transition. You know, you kind of like you already had a dream job, but I mean, that's like a really good problem to have, and I think that's kind of speaks to like, you know, when you know, if you're really passionate about game making and like get into the industry, you know, and you're there, like. There's a lot of things and a lot of opportunities that just grab you and you like want to do and like you know there's always kind of a newer and you know 
bigger scope project and stuff that's like always happening right and it's it's really neat and like i mean i think both you know both me brian and i can you know both coming from the community we just are extremely like you know fortunate that you know we um were able to have that opportunity even to begin with and you know it, it does it seems like it is kind of a it's a dream really i mm, yeah yeah I don't know, like, that's, like, it's weird, like, it's weird to be able to, you know, work on something that was, you know, your hobby before, uh, I don't know, not, not, I don't think everybody gets, gets that lucky to have that opportunity, so. And it's definitely by, definitely by the second job, it's really cemented in you, too, because on Project Spark, I always kept on thinking about, people are going to find out that I'm not meant to be here at some point, for some reason, people are going to, like, find out and just kick me out, that's going to happen, but then, once I got this, this job, uh, you know, at Wizards of the Coast, I realized, Oh, I'm I'm like these people now because I've worked at more than one company, so mm. I, this might become a thing. Like it's people... kind of like a it's kind of like a patch, right? <laughs> yeah. like, you know, <laughs> I'm now like a two star, not general, nowhere near general, but two star <laughs> like uh... general issue. Sure, general issue. <laughs> nice, major general. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, so I just wanted to say that real quick. All right, so next question that we're asking is. What are you currently creating in Project Spark? <laughs> or what would you have created if it wasn't for Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> well, what what yeah. is he going to be working on now then? Like so, more of that. I'm assuming augment your your developer game jam creation with you were talking about adding more things, but yeah, uh, I like the next. I have the next part. Um, so, like basically, the, what I have in this game is up to Bobtown and finishing that whole quest line. Um, so I can definitely do a lot more polishing on that. I think like I want to make some the, some of the boss battles better, but um, I I think I will jump into making the next scene too. There are some other stuff in Project Spark I was kind of interested in, but I think I might move into that. Zombie Punch Five. <laughs> no, Zombie Punch Three. I no, I made I, episodes three, th- three and four. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't figured out. I got to like this great almost halfway point, and then I. I just still have not been able to figure out how to make it actually fun. So that's been really on the back burner of like, I, I really, I really want to make, I mean, m- like my dream kind of the, the one kind of game I've always wanted to make is a really fun game where you play the zombie. And I still feel like with zombie punch three, I haven't figured out what makes that so fun. So that's been on the back burner. If I ever figure that out, I'll go back to it and, uh, and actually put it in. Cause the first, the first one and two were just the fact that I made a game where you play zombie, which, you know, that part's cool, but like, what is it that makes being a zombie really fun? That's what I've been kind of been struggling with. You need to make it a point and click adventure game where you are the zombie and you need to trick people into thinking you're not a zombie so that you can punch them. <laughs> yeah, but Lucas Ar- Lucas that's Arts. not fun. <laughs> Lucas Arts, Lucas Arts games are hilarious. They're awesome. Those are, those are hilarious, but it's not like, it doesn't, it doesn't fit like what, what makes a really good zombie game where you're the zombie for me yet. See, I think it's like a hard, it's a hard dynamic to try to get because a zombie, right, traditionally is, they're slow, they they have, they're not, you know, they're supposed to be like mob-minded, right, and you can't like, you know, there's no like, you know, they, they're not walking around with tools, like they're not picking up like, you know, weapons do like attack or, you know, have like an arsenal, right, they're kind of this, you know, mindless animal, you know, in a whole group, and like, usually when you're playing as somebody, right, it's this heroic element of, like, they stand out, they're separate from the pack, they have all these tools, you know, to take on, like, you know, you know, pretty much they they have the tools to take on the monsters that are zombies, right, which are, like, the, you know, the mindless mass of things, so, like, trying to switch that around, it's like, you know, how do I maintain an identity of a zombie, but, you know, d- you know, how does my zombie kind of stand out, you know, you know, if I am kind of slow or more part of the pack, but, like, how does that become fun? Like, is it, you know, by making it where you, like, have crowd control or, you know, you have a way to control, like, your this horde of zombies potentially you build up or, you know, what have you. But it's, it's definitely an interesting kind of problem, I think, because it's, like, it wouldn't feel like a zombie, right, if, like, you treated your zombie like a, a you know, like a hero and he could move as, you know, quickly and, you know, have zombie weapons and i don't know like it wouldn't really right make sense. and the thing the thing that like i really it just couldn't figure out how to do right is i wanted like basically i wanted i turn something into a zombie and it goes off and has its own adventure and 
So, like, I could come back to uh, this section of the city or town, and then, like, that whole district is has become zombies because of all these series of unfortunate events. Or that zombie was just killed by the first human it saw. Um, so, I, I, like, that part is... So there's, like, randomness, but it also has to be scripted. So that part, I haven't, that part I really couldn't figure out to get it. So it's random, but also scripted enough so that's, that something interesting was was probably going to happen. Bound to happen, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, that's yeah, that's, that's I, like, something that I'm just... It's in the back of my mind still. Mm-hmm. You should have it where, like... Or, like, I think it would be kind of a neat function of, like, you know... You, your lives are like limited by the number of zombies that you create. So when you die, you don't get that zombie yes. back, but you spawn as another one. You, I was, I always thought you would just take the place of another zombie. Yeah. I, actually, the biggest thing that I struggle with is what would actually make this game fun enough where you'd want to replay it. So like, what what makes it fun enough so that you know? Because I want it to be an open open ended open world game where you just the objective is just to turn the whole city into zombies. Mm-hmm. And so like, what is what are the things that make it really replayable? Um, besides the fact that every time something slightly different happens, it becomes very samey soon, so that's the real biggest struggle um, for me, is like it's also kind of just making it so that it's a very re- replayable game. Alright, so uh, we're f- about 52 minutes into it, so you want to do the third question? <laughs> sure. Well, we're, we're, getting, we're, we're trying to be detailed here. <laughs> this is a detailed All oriented right. stream. So, yes. last question is, and you'll probably actually laugh about the wording of this, but that'll just be an inside joke between me and you, okay? <laughs> um, so, what are your hopes and dreams for your future Project Spark related or not? <laughs> you know what that's um, <laughs> My hope and dream is to make the best video game ever! <laughs> that's pretty much it. I just want, I want to make really good video games. What are your so, hopes for Project Spark in general? Uh, my hope for Project Spark is that, um, like, I think a lot of people, when it went to free, a lot of people started to bemoan the fact that, oh, it's just not going to be the same, people are going to leave. So, like, my hope and dream for Project Spark is that it will start to gain more and more in popularity uh, in this organic fashion because it's free. So people check it out, and there's no barrier. They just start creating in it. And, I mean, with Kodu, you look at that, and that didn't take off for, like, four years or so after it came out. Like, it came out in four years. It was kind of dormant, and it started building up more and more. So my hope and dream is that Project Spark kind of follows that same trajectory of um, there's just organically people start coming in at a faster and faster rate, and then, um, you know, it, it keeps on growing to this to this the big thing that uh, we always hoped it would be. Mm-hmm. Like, in the you know, to touch on the point with Kodu, it's like, you know, when that happens in organic growth like that, um, I mean, it, it brings back reinvestment and, you know, it's like, you know, they're working on more stuff now because there's more of a, you know, group. And so this, you know, this game that came out in Kodu came, you know, Kodu Game Lab came out in 2009. Um, it was released. I mean, it's morphed already considerably since then, but... You know, like, I mean, it's kind of like now that there's such a, you know, crowd for it and it's it's pretty popular, like, you know, they can start making, you know, asking other questions. Like, you know, obviously I don't know too much about it, so don't take anything that I, you know, you know, say as like being news or anything. But if they were, you know, they could, you know, make more versions and, you know, and more features and, you know, maybe even a Kodu 2, right? I mean, like, that stuff becomes on the table when you have the audience there. And, like, I think that's the benefit of Spark in any community-driven games, right, is it's kind of like, I mean, when we put it out there, it's honestly, it's out of our hands. It really is. It's, like, totally community-driven. And, you know, and if, you know, that organic growth comes back, you know, Microsoft and us and everybody, we can't ignore that. Um, So I'd love to see that happen. Mm -hmm. So the... uh... I guess there's two more questions, but we can just go with the fourth one. What were your three favorite UGC in Spark? Not just of this year, but of all time. Probably, I mean, they're they're continually getting better, so... The more recent, it, yeah. If I objectively looked at it, it would probably be the, like the three most recent I played. So instead, I'll look at just the, the UGC that, like, when, when I played that finally, I, those were kind of touchstones in, in my understanding of Spark. And the first of those was actually Crystal Story, by um, Auntie Ren, 
because it was a uh, isometric view and it was it was the first time I'd ever seen this was like right when right when I got into Spark it was January 2014 so right when the gates were slowly being open for people to to uh, to play through and that game was on there and it was the first time that I saw that you could you really could make your own adventure inside of it because I was always worried looking at Spark before I jumped in that this looks too good to be true I feel like you can't really make your own experience there has to be some sort of limitation uh, like some some like limitation where like no you can't have dialogue boxes or like or like no, you're stuck in a in a 3D action adventure um, brain. So like when I saw that, I was like, oh wow! If I invest the time, I can make a like a cool Zelda adventure game or whatever. So that like that came out. Um, that I got super excited about what I could make that. Um, then uh, next one was um, uh, Bloody Ninja by uh, what's this like the Ginger Man? I think oh, the Ginger Bread okay. Man or something. I don't exactly. think it was Gingerbread Man. It was, was like it Gunny the, Sack Man. No, not Gunny Sack Man. It was something Ginger. I forget. But um, <laughs> anyways, ginger like that hermit? game. Yes, the Ginger Hermit. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but that, when that game came out, that was the first really good design game um, where I, where I was like, oh, right, this design thing to make levels look interesting. That's the thing. I should think about that. So that like. That blew my mind when that came out. It looked like um, a modern city of sorts, like stylized yeah. but still modern. Exactly, um, and then, then probably, oh, I, I, then it gets to like then it starts to get more modern. So uh, there's like so many games that are up there of like X Zero and uh, then uh, Def, every Defco level and then like <laughs> Zeeful's level. Um, but actually, I'll probably say uh, Zeeful's uh, Ragnarok game was probably the next one that's up on my list because, like, it, uh, it's the first game where, like, there are a lot of games that are fun, contained experiences, but that was the first game that I played in Project Spark where I actually didn't want to stop playing because it was exactly hit the itch of the type of game I wanted to play. It's not you know the game everyone wants to play because it's it's very much a hoarding RPG style game. It reminded me so much of Maple Story, which is a game I used to play back in the day in the day. Um, but yeah, it was the first game where I really didn't want to stop playing it. And so I think I spent like I played it for two, three hours straight and then I hit a bug so I couldn't continue on. But yeah. Well, here's where I actually get to rag on you a little bit, because when he watched you play on the stream, he saw you continually press X like you were going to swing the sword each time. And you didn't know it was a toggle that you turned oh, on yeah. the stack. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah, that was before yeah. Brian like played through it like fully, though. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was. this is like five minutes before we, we, went on, we went on the stream. I had seen it being created, and I was like, oh, yeah, we should do that. And I quickly went through it, and it's like, oh, I'll skip this tutorial. I'll know this. Uh-oh, no, I, I don't. <laughs> We're we're coming in usually pretty hot and then the live streams, so yeah. <laughs> fair warning on that. If it if it wasn't obvious enough. <laughs> yeah, I saw it first person you guys were uh just sitting around eating uh candy and drinking soda that was all free. And then like when the stream timer came up like, uh, I guess we gotta run to the stream room. No, we got like five minutes, we can go over there then. And then like after the time hit then you're like, I guess we'll start walking over. Oh, I still left some I left my soda back at the desk. I'll go get it. <laughs> That's what happened. Yep. Uh, exactly how things happen. <laughs> uh, wow, we're we pretty close here. Yep. So, a couple, a couple more questions. Uh, any possibility for Project Spark plus HoloLens to work together? Uh, no announcements there. Um, I mean, I would, if if anything like that were to happen, it would not be, uh, you know, soon. It would be far, far into the future. Is what I would I would put on that. And unlikely to ever see a 360 version, still. Three 360 version will never be developed. Well, there's that. Can pretty much give a definite. I mean, like at this yep. point, like, we've always said it's you know indefinitely delayed. But um, I don't see any reason why. Um, I mean, it, obviously 360 is a great product. Um, and you know, in, in the you know homes of a ton of people, but kind of you know it's always more like being focused on the future. I think is. Kind of, you know, where things are tending toward, as opposed to where things were tending, um, or trending, uh, you know. So, I just, yeah, I don't see a 360 version happening, and no PlayStation or, or Wii version either. Oh yeah, yeah. We what about are... a Commodore 64? It's not, 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 not ruled out. Yeah, <laughs> Sega Genesis maybe too. 
for, for, for iPhone app. Yeah. Actually, Windows but, Phone maybe. Mm-hmm. Because if you guys like, like you yeah. said they That's keep true. getting more more powerful, so maybe I'll work on a phone someday. Probably. Yeah, I mean, well, you're you probably you're be able to do that. I I haven't seen anything of it, and I, I have no idea. So this is just me guessing, right? So. Um, but I think they showed, right, where you can, you know how the, the Xbox app, you can, like, stream from your Xbox One to it, but I think that works for, like, any Windows 10 device, so I think you can, like, stream, like, if you had Project Spark on your Xbox, you could, like, stream it to your phone at some point. I don't know if that works on, like, the new Lumias or whatever, but I would imagine that would be possible at some point. Yeah, probably just a few, way, uh, like, a few years away from that, basically, of your phone being as powerful as a laptop. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the cool thing about the streaming thing is it, like, doesn't actually, it's running on your Xbox, and it just, like, basically your input and your output comes through, but that's it. It's the only thing happening on your phone. It doesn't have to process anything. All right, so the mm -hmm. next topic is going to be, real quickly, is going to be to the concept art for the week. Um, Brian, yeah. you're going to see it slightly on delay, but I'm sure you're going to have some con uh, com comments about it as well. So, Thomas, you, since you know what it is, you can go ahead and start talking. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So this is um, just to continue with the trend here of um, what we've done for the last couple of weeks. We wanted to include a concept image, um, and we've been showing off a lot of the um, kind of early iterations of elves. So this is kind of like the hero spread. Um, so it's a bunch of different, you can see different faces. Um, some of the concept art that we've shown before, you can see those here now, like kind of idealized. Um, especially like I think we saw the exact face on like uh, three and four on the lineup. Um, but in different outfits, uh, you see the nature, um, which we saw in the past concept art. That's the the third one. But different robes, things like that. Um, plenty of swirls. You can see in the the wardrobes. You gotta have mm -hmm. like a <clears throat> sorcerer, and you got um, it almost looks like kind of a necromancer on the far right, kind of in that like spider spider web back, but or more like a oh yeah type thing. I don't know. I thought it was like the, the poor the poor version of the uh, the elves. <laughs> From the slums. Yeah, more like wood elves, I don't mm -hmm. know. But, um, but yeah, so, you know, again, elves were something that they, you know, early on were working on, and they actually ended up mor morphing more toward uh, our kind of Codian um, series is like what um, ended up happening. But, uh, but yeah, we were definitely experimenting with elves, so I uh, wanted to share that with you guys. Yeah, they can never get elves to the point where the, where the art team was happy with them. That's basically yep. what it came down to. They, they never got... Uh, they worked on lots of different variations of elves. Some of them look more like the Keebler elves, way too cutesy. Some of them look more like this. They could never get it to a point where they were really happy about it, but like Thomas was saying, they sort of took this design and and uh, they really incorporated it in the Codians, and then they kind of infuse in the Codians this like cyberpunk elf type uh, thing in, instead of going down this route of, of elves. Yep. All right, then. Uh, yeah, some of those outfits are pretty sweet. <laughs> I'd like to see those on other characters. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so cool with that. Um, so before uh, we get out of here, I do want to kind of talk a little bit about the new streams on Thursday and kind of do um, just know what you guys can expect. So we talk about it in the last state of Spark. Um, so what we're doing with Thursday streams going forward is they're going to be very community centric. They're going to be based on us choosing choosing a creation from the community. Um, you know, not we're not looking for things that are like ridiculously polished. You know, like. X Zero or um, you know Invasion Two or anything like in the Hall of Fame, right? So look for work uh, in progress. Yeah, exactly. Work in progresses or or what have you. But we want to take that and then on stream we want to we want to play through it, talk about you know what our thoughts are, and then what we do is you know we announce what this creation is going to be beforehand, and it allows an opportunity for the community to come in and actually you know and remix it and add to it and make their own improvements, and we can kind of check those out all together too and show off. So. And, you know, if we want to do a stream, right, and it's, you know, this so maybe this world has really cool mechanics, but, you know, just didn't have the best design or art um, that really, like, guided the player or made it look inter interesting, somebody could go in, um, you know, and remix that, and we'll be able to play that on stream and see the direction they took that. And what would be cool if we get multiple people, um, you know, we can see all the different ways that people decided to, you know, design that creation. Or if there's a code problem, right, they can go in and fix that, but it's kind of like, a way for the community to jump in, help you know make this world better, really kind of show the power of what Remix can do in collaboration, um, and have a fun time doing it on stream. I think. And of course, if there's time, um, I think we'll also like on stream. You know, I'll go in and you know remix and try to make improvements from what I can. 
Um, we haven't picked a world yet for this week. Um, that is literally what I'm going to be doing. As soon as I am finished here on this, I'm going to find a world that I like, and I'll post it to the forum so you guys can check that out. And then uh, I'll also I'll make a, um, I'll add it. I think I'll bank a post just onto the state of Spark in that forum thread about it. And then I'll, I'll again, reiterate uh, what we'll be looking for uh, for tomorrow's live stream. So, again, that's 3 o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, Pacific time, and that's when we're going to do it. And these will be uploaded to YouTube. So Brian, are you going to be cool. joining one of the, uh, doing one of the remixes? I, think I don't know. For we'll the see. next twenty hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> um, I mean, it's that's that part's hard because the reason why I haven't been on, on any of these um, sportcasts is because it's the same time as my work. Are you going back to work, work tomorrow? And I, uh, no, I'm actually off this week. Um, so that's that's the nice thing. I'm off this whole week, but. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't justify telling my work. Oh, hey, I have this um, this uh, little stream. I I want to uh, to be on instead of doing really important work right now. This is a joint Friday Spark and Magic the Gathering uh, podcast. <laughs> we'll mention Magic the Gathering like once or twice per episode. So <laughs> I think all the other Magic the Gathering podcasts will be very will like come after you and be like, who is this guy? We must okay. shut him down. <laughs> hey, listen, man. I've only played the game once. Don't, don't go after me. I only, the most I know from about <laughs> Magic the Gathering is one from somebody who introduced me to the game and then beat the living snot out of me while doing the tutorial, and two uh, from the South Park episode where it was rooster magic. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's right. And yeah. yeah, so in any event. Uh, Thank you, Brian, for joining us. We know that you haven't slept in two days, so yep. you're probably going to be passing out as soon as this is over. Yep. Oh, Thanks for joining, Brian. For that. Yeah. And you no slept in problem. airports and were uh, using the return of carts to get quarters to buy meals? <laughs> no, and I, I never slept in the airport because uh, it's really hard to sleep in airports. Oh, Especially when there's a lot of other people who are trying to sleep at an airport, I think. <laughs> that's the... Especially when there's construction going on at your gate, also. Oh. Ew. <laughs> Some nightmare. <laughs> it's all kinds of awful. Yep. Hopefully you found, maybe there was like a corner where a bunch of people were playing Magic the Gathering and you like had your deck ready and you were just like... Ch -ch -ch -ch. <laughs> so do you carry on No, those, those were checked. Oh, my, right. my deck was checked, even if I'd seen that. that. Do you carry See, around cards you in your first pockets? Mistake, or anything? Man, you never check a deck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> never. I do check. not carry cards in my pockets. Because <laughs> I, uh, one of the former community managers or uh, brand managers at Wizards of the Coast that worked on Landmark uh, was Omid, and he said he would carry around like rare cards in his pocket and like leave them as part of tips and stuff like that. But wouldn't people just be like, what is this? What am I going to do with this? And then, well, like, they're I know. You would have to know. So, like, if I left it for a waiter who didn't know anything about Magic the Gathering, I might give him a $200 card, and he'd be like, well, this well, is silly. Uh, throw it away. Usually, like, they'd introduce themselves as, like, being, like, part of that or, if, you know, talking about Magic. And then if the person said, oh, I play Magic too, then that's what they'd say. Or my son plays Magic, and then leave that as part of their tip uh, for them. So... I'm gonna I'm gonna step in real quick before uh, <laughs> before the rumor mill gets going. No, Magic the Gathering assets are not coming to Project Spark. <laughs> or are so they, Thomas? Know. Are they? <laughs> hey, listen, you two need to don't get together. <laughs> so this is just in. Wizards of the Coast is producing content for Project Spark. <laughs> Wizards of the Coast has bought in Thomas and all, and all Project Spark. That's exactly exactly my reason for going over there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hostile takeover of sorts. <laughs> yeah. Magic the Spark. All right, so there will be no more. Uh, there will, not, not no more, but there will not be a, a Friday stream. I take it this week. Yeah, there will not. We're gonna do our um, brand new creation stream uh, tomorrow, but uh, I will not be here on Friday. And hopefully, you guys are you know out with your families, taking the day off, doing whatever crazy stuff you're doing. But it's New Year's Day for everybody in the world, so. Um, enjoy the day. I'm going to take some time and enjoy it with my family. So we're not going to do stream, um, but we'll be all back full week starting, you know, in the new year. January 4th is Monday and we're going to be hitting the ground running. Should be fun. 
And what's the timeline for the uh, Game Jam? When are we going to tell people who won? Uh, definitely in January. It'll probably be like mid to late, I'd say, but um, shouldn't be any later than that unless, um, you know, people judge the same way that I make judges, uh, make dungeons, then it'll take a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we'll, we'll just say it's uh, January of 2017. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there you go. All right, so thanks, everybody, for joining, and uh, thanks, chat, for being so active and asking a lot of questions today. That was really awesome. Uh, yep. Brian, thanks for joining us, even though you haven't slept in 48-plus hours. And Thomas? Six now, I think. So good luck with that. You're back on uh, <laughs> West Coast time, so it's still mid-afternoon for you. Yeah, that's true. If you're that's back true. home, then it'll be, like, almost bedtime anyway. Mm-hmm. All right, and thanks, Thomas, for joining us as usual, because what else do you have to do? That's what I do. Talk to us. <laughs> oh, and this is a perfect time to close it off because the phone's ringing. All right, thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye.